We begin uh, today in the book of Job and we pick up from verse 1. Job chapter 1 and verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job, and said, The oxen were ploughing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them, and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another, and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were drinking and eating, in wi uh, were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose, and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charge God foolishly. Amen. So we're going to have a quick uh, run through of the first chapter of Job. And Job as a book is, well, it's it's got a, a lot of significance in many ways. And some of the key themes of the book of Job are as follows, really. Why do bad things happen to uh, quote unquote good people? The, the book of Job, it teaches us that uh, suffering is not always necessarily as a result of sin. Suffering is, is not always necessarily a result of sin. We understand um, the sort of twin doctrine to eternal security. 
being the doctrine of sonship. Once you are saved and born again, you become an adopted child of the Lord. He is now your heavenly father and he deals with you as with uh, sons. We, we are chastened of God and at times we bring things upon ourselves as part of God's correction. But suffering is not always necessarily a result of sin. There is more at work many times. Another theme of the book of Job is that the thing of uh, responding to suffering. And oftentimes the response to suffering in the eyes of God is more important than the reasons for suffering itself. The book of Job covers the age-old battle uh, between God and the devil. Of course, you know, the Lord could flick Satan and send him scattering off to the other side of the universe in less than a breath. But we understand from this book that the Lord's will, his uh, counsel, will always be fulfilled, uh, no matter what the devil thinks, no matter what he tries, and no matter what he does. And the Lord, uh, throughout the book of Job, proves uh, the devil wrong time and time again. The book of Job covers why do the godly suffer? Why do those who seem to be walking uprightly, uh, living as they ought to as, as believers, why do they go through such hard times? And why is it that God at times seems to hide his face in times of great trouble? Why doesn't the Lord bail us out uh, each and every time something bad happens in life? Again, this is covered in the book of Job. Job teaches us the necessity of faith and patience uh, mixed with that faith. In James chapter 5, uh, verses 10 to 11, it says this, Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and you have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. We see this patience in Job, uh, worked out throughout these 42 chapters and we can be edified by this uh, when we go through very uh, unpleasant times and trials in our lives today, the necessity of faith. And lastly, and I'm sure there's many other key themes of the book of Job, but it, it really highlights the fact that God has intimate uh, knowledge of all of us over his people and he cares for us. And this book is summed up, isn't it, by Romans 8.28. All things work together uh, for good to them that are, uh, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So Job, there's many things we can say before we get into the chapter. Job is as a man who will be tested. According to the Ruckman Reference Bible, you'll find even the name Job means uh, one persecuted. In type, in picture, he's a type of the Jew going through the time of Jacob's trouble. It's very interesting, you know, and I'm going to touch upon this uh, a bit more in detail later, but Job, he has 42 chapters of his book, which lines up with his uh, 42 months in the tribulation, three and a half years. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of similarities there, even the ge geographical position of the land of Uz uh, being where the Jews will flee to uh, during this time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, Petra, this rock city in, on the southern border of modern-day Israel near Jordan. Uh, he is a, a great type of the Jew who will suffer during this time. And as I've read, James chapter 5, verses 10 to 11 indicate that Job is a prophet. We find his book amongst the wisdom books of the Bible. And in that, we understand that Job is the oldest book of the Bible. It was uh, written somewhere around 1800 uh, years BC, according to Usher's chronology. And again, if you look at the Ruckman Reference Bible, you'll find that it says that Elihud wrote uh, Job. We know, chronologically speaking, Job takes place uh, after the flood and evidence to suggest that would be found in Job 22, verses 15 to 16. It says this, Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden? They knew that wicked men had been before them, which were cut down out of time, uh, cut off prematurely, killed before their time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood. So Job's time is after 
the flood. And we know that because of his uh, genealogy in that sense. Even where Job finds himself geographically, uh, the land of Uz, that is named after a man who shows up in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 23. You have the land of Uz where Job lives. And you have this man, Genesis chapter 10, verse 23. And the children of Aram, Uz and Hul and Githur and Mash. Uz is the son of Aram, verse 22. Aram is the son of Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. The Jews descend from this line of oriental people. Shem is a son of Noah. So, Uz, as I've said, um, is in the Shemitic land of modern day uh, southern Israel, uh, Transjordan. And really, when you look at the book of Job, chapters 1 and 2, they are all about uh, setting the scene for the following 42 chapters that you'll read. Uh, the, the, the devil, he uh, makes accusations about Job, about mankind in general. Uh, we realise he's um, already, several angels have already uh, rebelled uh, pre-flood, haven't they? They've come down to earth to uh, mingle with the daughters of men. And the devil, I believe, is challenging the Lord um, concerning his relationship with man, why the Lord is so long-suffering and forbearing with this sinful fallen race who seem to uh, disobey him and cause the Lord to have to chastise them time and time again throughout the Old Testament. And all these angels, these sons of God, are watching on as this um, discourse is continuing between Job and the Lord. And we understand that the devil claims that Job would curse God if God removed his protection and blessings from him. And we understand in the first chapter that God does this. He does remove his blessings and protection from Job for a time. But he does not grant the devil permission to touch Job. And Job, without him even realising it, is found in the middle of this challenge between God and the devil. And Job in chapter 1. He responds to this trial in the right way by blessing the Lord in times of great suffering. So we go to uh, chapter 1, uh, Job chapter 1, and we pick up from verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, just uh, spoken about where Uz is and the significance of Uz being named after this uh, son of Aram, uh, who descends from Shem. There's another note in the Ruckman Reference Bible, you know, you have the Wizard of Oz, and Ruckman claims this is a counterfeit of us, us and Oz, the lost world, take much from the scriptures without them even realising it. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, Job meaning one persecuted, and that man was four things, perfect, number one, and number two, upright, and number three, one that feared God, and number four, one that eschewed evil. So he's perfect. Does that necessarily mean that he was uh, sinlessly perfect? Uh, no, of course not. You've got as a cross-reference to this. Perfect does not always mean sinlessly perfect in scripture. Uh, turn to uh, 2 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse uh, 16 to 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Does that mean sinlessly perfect? Of course not. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. I beg your pardon, verse 12. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Uh, Epaphras, which is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, uh, always labouring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in what? In all the will of God. Perfect in all the will of God. He's complete in all the will of God. This is Job. He is obedient. Not only this, he is also upright. He's perfect and upright. He is uh, moral. He is making choices that please the Lord. He is not departing to the left or to the right. He's one that feared God, and his righteousness is premised upon this uh, fear of God. That is what it is based upon. You know, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 talks about uh, the fear of the Lord being the, the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. And the fear of God is to know that God is holy, 
and it is to live life accordingly. Uh, we understand from the scriptures that God hates sin and he judges sin. And it is, it is the lack of, of the fear of God that has caused the world uh, to become so corrupt and, and morally uh, debased. And when men do not fear God, as it happened in the days of Noah, as it's happening today, they walk after the imagination of their own corrupt hearts and go off into all sorts of evil and sin. If people feared the Lord as Job did and his holy justice, they would not live the way they do. And if you feared God, I wonder what things in your life would change if you truly feared God. Job was a man that did this. And lastly, the fourth uh, characteristic of characteristic of Job was that he eschewed evil he didn't look upon it he separated himself from it as a, a type of uh, Christian today in 2023 he would be one who lives a, a separated a sanctified life verse 2 so we, we have a lot to admire in the character of Job and there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters So Job has ten children in total, seven sons and three daughters. And this really, the next couple of verses are going to show you uh, the prosperity of Job. And we have here really the Old Testament type of prosperity. And we've seen this time and time again. The the more favour you had with God in the Old Testament, you see the Old Testament was very physical. And there's a deeper study on this, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the the Old and the New uh, Testament and... um, the many deep teachings of dispensationalism. But generally speaking, in the Old Testament, the more favour you had with God, the more material blessings you would have. And that included children. And that's why it was a curse in the Old Testament uh, to women to have a barren womb, because they would be denied children. That would be uh, a curse to them. And it's not like that today. Uh, we understand for, for the born-again believers today, we receive spiritual blessings for the most part. You know, we think about the, the godly martyrs, William Tyndale, uh, you know, the, the disciples who became the apostles, the Lord himself even at the first advent. They lived very materialistically poor lives, didn't have a whole lot of money, land, prosperity, all these material blessings. And yet they were totally uh, within the will of God. They were blessed with spiritual blessings. But Job is prosperous and his prosperity continues to verse 3. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the the greatest of all the men of the east. So you have here Job's assets, 7,000 sheep. I looked online uh, the other night at the price of uh, live sheep and I saw one uh, for sale on farming ads, uh, a black nose valet. It was a well-bred pedigree of sheep on sale for £12,345. And if you had 7,000 of those well-bred uh, pedigree sheep in your flock, you'd be worth over £86 million pounds today. So Job was an incredibly wealthy man. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses. So, and we also hear that he had a very great household. So we assume that he had many employees, servants, labourers, and so on. You you could bring this up to date and uh, compare him to a man who has uh, many assets in business, many warehouses, many uh, trucks and, and heavy goods vehicles, many factories, means of production. He's a very wealthy man. He has a very great household, many people underneath him. And he has status so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. He is, a, he is the greatest, and I'm sure many people would be jealous of Job. He'd be considered a multimillionaire today, possibly even a billionaire. And again, you, you notice in type, this is a picture of the Jews uh, pre-tribulation, pre-time of Jacob's trouble. We, we think about the Jews today, you know, they are uh, very prominent, aren't they, in banking, Goldman Sachs, you know, the Rothschilds banking family, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and, and Larry Page, Sergey Brin in all this uh, technology space, uh, Sir Philip Green, Lord Sugar, even David Beckham. You find people who are Jewish or have Jewish uh, roots 
tend to um, succeed in all these different fields, top bankers, top sportsmen, top businessmen, top lawyers, top accountants, musicians and actors. The, the Jews, they are disproportionately successful and they tend to succeed in whatever they get involved with. We even look at the nation of Israel. They are very blessed uh, as a very small nation. They do very well for themselves considering uh, how the nation surrounding them, these Muslim Arab nations, do not prosper as Israel does. And as such, many Gentiles are very jealous of the Jews uh, because they succeed. They have the, the blessing of the Lord upon them, even if they are in rebellion to him today. And again, I'm sure there's jealousy uh, around Job of his uh, blessings and success. Verse 4, And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one uh, his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So all his sons, they all have houses, they all have property, they do well. The children, they're having a family uh, get together, they are feasting. Again, they have abundance, there's no shortage, they're not starving, they're not on the breadline. They, they enjoy worldly things, they are uh, successful, prominent, they enjoy abundance. And verse 5, and it was so, this is Job, when the days of their feasting were gone about, so the party's over, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings. He, he uh, offers these animals according to the number of them all, ten of them. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So Job is such a holy, uh, righteous, upright man that he wants to ensure that not only is he right with God, but that his children are too. And we understand this is a pre-law uh, sense Job, he is living before the, the, the law was given to Moses. But even then, in this ancient time, he understood that blood had to be shed for the remission of sins. He's offering burnt offerings to the Lord. We have uh, Noah's sacrifice in Genesis 8, verse 20. Again, this is pre-law, uh, where... And Noah built an, an altar un, unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the, 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 the key to this is summed up in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, talking about the significance of blood. Again, this is all type and picture of what is to come in Christ. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So Job here is taking preemptive measures just in case his children have sinned, not outwardly, but even so in their hearts. And that's how much that Job feared the Lord. And the Lord, he talks about the sins of the heart in Matthew chapter 5 at his first advent. And even you look all over the world, and this is getting a little bit off topic, but you study the Inca people and the Aztecs and the Mayans, and they made blood sacrifices in order to appease their gods. These ancient people knew that blood uh, was connected to the forgiveness of sins, even if it was uh, distorted in their understanding. So Job fears the Lord, and he takes preemptive measures to ensure that he is right with God and his children are too. And it says at the, the end of verse 5, Thus did Job continually. We read in Psalms 10 verse 4 about the thing of God being in all their, in, not in all their thoughts. Let me just turn there quickly rather than me just paraphrasing all the time. Uh, Psalms 10 verse 4. Uh, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Well, Job was, on the contrary, God was in all his thoughts and he was continually thinking about the Lord and he was concerned about his relationship with him. And now the scene changes because we're about to go up into the throne room of God. Verse 6, now there was a, we're no longer in the land of Uz. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. They bring themselves before God and Satan came also among them. So Satan is this anointed cherub who's fallen. He's been uh, cast down at this time. And he is standing amongst these angels, these sons of God. And we know these sons of God are angels. There's a couple of cross-references. 
Uh, Job chapter 38 verse 7 talks about uh, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation. And you also have Genesis 6 and verse 4 talking about these, uh, and it repented the Lord. Uh, sorry, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. These are angels, but these are not fallen angels. These are before the throne of God. And what happens here? We see the devil. Uh, they present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Satan can come and talk to God. And we have no concept of these beings, really. You know, Ruckman tells us in, in, through his study on angels, I, I recommend you look into that, that they look like 33-year-old men. And perhaps they do on this uh, earthly physical realm. Um, I believe here we're in the third heaven and I'm sure the laws of physics work differently there. Who knows what sort of uh, appearance they, they take on. Again, we, there's so much uh, in Job that is very mysterious to us. But uh, carrying on with the chapter. Uh, verse 7 says this, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So the Lord speaks to the devil. It's just the, the Godhead speaking, the Father, the pre-incarnate Son. We, we, we're not told. It just says the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Where have you come from? You know, where have you been, Satan? And the devil responds, he's been in the earth, walking, walking up and down in it. Um, and he's been going to and fro in the earth. Again, in the earth and not on it. We would say that we've been up and down. We've been up and down the motorway on the earth. We, we live on the earth, not in the earth. So it's very interesting because the, you know, the, the devil, is, as we know him today, he is a spirit being. So it's very hard for us to totally uh, fathom his movements. But we learn even from this verse, verse 7, that he is not God. He is not omnipresent. He has uh, one position at one time. He, he travels. He has to move around. And the devil counterfeits the omnipresence of God through his uh, kingdom of devils, plural, devils. And I'm sure they know all about us. Uh, the Bible talks about the thing of familiar spirits, his kingdoms, powers, princes, domin dominions, principalities, all underneath the devil, the god of this world. But he is limited. And verse uh, 8 says this, And the Lord said unto Satan, because we're assuming that the devil is looking for somebody to persecute or bring before the Lord. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, and there is none that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? Again, the Lord's asking the devil, Have you seen Job? And this description of Job, uh, perfect, upright, fears God, eschews evil, it matches verse 1 perfectly. So the Lord is speaking very highly of Job, very highly indeed. Then Satan answered the Lord, and you can almost sense it in his voice, can't you? And said, doth Job fear God for naught? Does, does Job fear God for nothing? He is terrified of you, Lord. He fears you. He wants to make sure he's right with you. He's doing his offerings, his sacrifices, and yet you speak well of him. And he continues, hast, thou, hast not thou made an hedge about him? And about his house, and about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. You know, does Job, does Job fear you, God, for nothing? You, you've made a hedge about him, you protect him, you protect his property, his house, you protect all his possessions on every side, you've blessed his labour, the work of his hands, and his wealth, his substance is increased in the land. You've given him prosperity, no wonder he fears you, no wonder he loves you. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. If you take away all these things you've given him, God, he's going to turn, and he's going to curse you. If you take away his uh, blessings, he will turn from you. And again, we ask ourselves as, as born-again believers today, are we like that? 
Are we fickle in our love towards God? Is our love for God conditional? Is it? Are we fair weather Christians? Is it only when things are going good do we praise the Lord? Once we hit bad times, do we continue to blame God? Or do we turn bitter towards God in spite of the goodness of the Lord? I hope we're not like that. And oftentimes we, we may be going through hard times, not as a result of our sin. Sometimes we may well do, but not always. We may be going through these times as, as some sort of a test, uh, the end of which will only be revealed for us at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, much like Job had to endure. And verse 12 says this, And the Lord, he responds to the devil, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. Uh, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So we have here the thing of God's permissive will. The Lord, he permits Satan to touch Job's things, his family, his possessions, his employees, all these things, his servants. But he cannot touch him yet. But that will come as you get into Job and read through it. Uh, the Lord does not grant the devil uh, this permission. And we have here even uh, a parallel in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse 5 and this talks about this man who is unrepentant and is involved in fornication with his father's wife i presume it's his stepmother uh, to deliver such this is the apostle paul speaking to deliver such an one unto satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the lord jesus sometimes the, the born again believers today are given over to the devil uh, not their souls but their flesh perhaps at times uh, to, to chastise us when we wander and stray and go off into unrepentant sin uh, hardship will humble us and lead us back to god oftentimes so what happens here well so satan went forth from the presence of the lord satan gets to work but little does the devil know, he's actually being used by God as a chess piece uh, for God to reveal himself to man and to show his righteousness in all things, even when bad things and calamities happen. But the devil does not understand this yet. He thinks he's been given a, a carte blanche uh, scope of uh, liberty to mess up Job's life, and that is what he's going to do. And this calamity begins in verse 13. And there was a day when his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder, eldest brother's house. So we're back down on earth now. We've left the throne room of God and we're into Job's um, eld, eldest uh, son's house, in their eldest brother's house. So they're having a party. We call this the calm before the storm. Times of leisure, times of respite, not expecting anything bad to happen. And oftentimes uh, life is just like that before some terrible, horrible thing happens. The calm before the storm. Verse 14, And there came a messenger unto Job, and said, The oxen were ploughing, and the asses feeding beside them, so bear in mind he had 500 yoke of oxen and 500 asses, 500 she-donkeys. And what happens to these um, to, to his flocks? And the Sabaeans fell upon them, so these bandits, uh, they've fallen upon his cattle and took them away. They've been stolen, his assets have been seized. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So his business has been hit. His servants, his workers have been killed. And Job has suffered a terrible loss here. Again, I think the Proverbs talk about riches that make themselves wings and fly away. Uh, money is very fickle. You can be uh, absolutely wealthy and successful one day and a beggar the next day in this world. Life is not fair. And we, another characteristic of the devil is revealed here. Um, verse 15, and the Sabaeans fell upon them. Well, who agitated these people to fall upon Job's property, Job's flocks? Well, it was the devil, of course. He, he has done this. He has been granted permission to do this. And we understand a lot of crazy uh, stuff we see in this world is uh, agitated, stirred up, uh, really, by the devil. Men are accountable uh, for their sins before the Lord. But the devil does cause strife, I'm sure of it. So he has the power to stir up conflict and stir up men's hearts to commit evil. And they yield to that and go that way. The power, the prince of the power of the air. 
And Job, in verse 16, he doesn't even have time to process this terrible uh, loss, this terrible ordeal, uh, because there's going to be some more bad news for him. Uh, verse 16, while yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So you have, <laughs> again... The fire of God is fallen from heaven. Well, that man is automatically blaming God for this terrible thing. The fire of God. How does he know that it was the fire of God? Well, of course, it's not the fire of God at all. The Lord has not done this. The devil, and this is another uh, characteristic of the devil that is revealed in Job. The devil has a measure of supernatural power which can appear uh, to mimic almost the, uh, the power of God. The devil in this instance caused fire to fall from heaven. And again, the, the devil has these strange uh, supernatural powers and he can cause strange supernatural things to happen. The Lord has not done this, but the Lord has permitted the devil to do this. God does not approve of what the devil has done. We understand even from this verse alone that the devil can counterfeit sign gifts and to bring it up to date, I'm sure a lot of the, these uh, crazy fake healings and fake tongues you see at these uh, charismatic, charismaniac churches today are of the devil. You see these, you know, in this kundalini yoga movement, people speaking in tongues, all this crazy stuff that the devil can confer a measure of spiritual power. And this ultimately culminates at the fake resurrection that takes place in Revelation 13, where this Antichrist character appears uh, to rise from the dead, counterfeiting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But, as we go back to verse 16, Job has lost all of his sheep, 7,000 of them, gone in an instant. Millions of pounds wiped off his net worth, and his servants have been killed too. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So Job has near enough lost his livelihood overnight. You know, put yourself in Job's shoes. How would you feel if your business folded, if your job uh, was uh, no more tomorrow? Uh, and again, the Lord, he has permitted the devil to do this for a greater cause. Uh, pursuant to Romans 8.28, all things working together for good. And they certainly do in the end to those that love God. Verse 17 to 18, more calamities are going to happen. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands. Again, the devil influences these men and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. More theft. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So there's just a further blow, blow upon blow upon blow to Job. He's being knocked um, off his feet. And verse uh, 18, while he was yet speaking, he doesn't even get time to process his third thing. A fourth thing comes along. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Verse 19, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So, this is by far and away, I believe, the worst thing that could have happened to Job, and that is the death of his children. A great wind uh, we read about in verse 19 uh, comes upon the four corners of this house and it collapses and kills all of his children. And only one servant escapes alive. And this reveals yet another thing about the devil. The devil has a measure of power over uh, natural elements, the elements, th this natural disaster occurring. You know, God did not send this great wind. I'm sure the devil was behind what happened here. And you cannot imagine Job's anguish at the loss of his children, the bitterness, the pain, the sorrow, because his children are dead. So Job has lost everything in the space of probably a couple of minutes. He's been told all these terrible things have happened at once and they say don't they when it rains it pours oftentimes you can have days where everything just goes from bad to worse and job is going to go into a test here verse 20 then job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head he shaves all his hair off he tears his clothes and fell down upon the ground and worshipped 
So he wants to get rid of anything between him and God, even the very hair in his head, he shaves it off, tears his mantle, falls down, gets down low before the Lord and worships God. He responds to suffering in the right way. He humbles himself before God, removes all barriers and distractions and gets down low before his Lord. And verse 21 is incredible. Then Job arose, uh, sorry, and said, Naked come I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And this is a great truth, a great verse that has been quoted by many Christians in times of suffering and loss and bereavement. The Lord uh, hath given, uh, the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I hope that uh, I hope that we can stand in in the day of suffering and be like Job. And the first part of this verse is a very hard thing for worldly men to stomach. Because everybody asks, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Unsaved people ask. The whole world asks this question. And for those that spend their entire lives building empires and businesses and stacking up wealth, all their days and qualifications, whatever it may be, the first part of this verse is very bitter. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. You cannot carry um, your wealth with you after death. The Americans say, you know, there's no uh, U-Haul at the undertaker's office. There's no uh, <laughs> there's no way you can carry all this thing uh, beyond the grave, all these worldly things. You are uh, going uh, to judgment, the judgment seat of Christ or to hell, the, the great white throne judgment and the lake of fire if you are indeed lost. And that is a very bitter truth for the world to swallow. And Job, in verse 22... Is commended, and all this Job sin not, nor charge God foolishly. In spite of all of these external circumstances, the most agonizing losses you can imagine, he's now bankrupt, he's got that is all his servants are dead, or many of his servants are dead. Um, his children, his all of his children have been killed in an instant, and, and yet Job is just before God, humble and praising the Lord in spite of all that is going on in the world. And that's how we ought to be as believers in the face of suffering. We ought not to charge God foolishly. And when we do go through these hard times, we ought to get rid of all this baggage and distraction and anything that is in the way of our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God. Amen.